Beatrice, let us know when we should start if we have uh, everybody uh, and so we can start uh, the meeting. Okay. Okay, it looks like it, there's a lull, so oh, why don't we get started? Okay, perfect. Thank you everybody for joining. Uh, it's the first CTL IP series of uh, this fiscal year, new fiscal year 2024. Uh, so let's start with a quick round of introduction of uh, the speaker of today. Uh, and so you know who's in uh, the room with you and will be uh, presenting to you this first topic that is underst understanding the technology transfer process. So I will start, I'm Linda Nseke. I'm the Assistant Director for Technology Initiative and Outreach at the Center for Technology Licensing. Uh, Chris, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Valentine Genki. I'm the Innovation Outreach Specialist and support Linda and all outreach tasks. Bill? My name is Bill Pegg. I'm the Director of Intellectual Property. I'm a patent attorney. I practiced for over 20 years prior to joining Cornell. I've been with CTL for over four years. Thanks. Marty? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Teschel. I'm the director of um, for business development and licensing, focusing on physical sciences for CTL. Thank you, Martin. Lisa? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Pekanik. I'm the senior managing director for the Center for Technology Licensing at the Wall Cornell Medicine Campus. Our office manages the intellectual property portfolio for Wall Cornell Medicine and our sister institution in Qatar. Great, thank you. And feel free to ask a question along the way, uh, we will address if it's we'll even doing the, uh, the topics that we address, we'll address it, so your question, or otherwise we'll uh, answer the question at the end. You can put that in the chat, you can also uh, ask your question, raise your hand at the end, we'll let you also ask directly, and you can unmute yourself. And uh, depending on the question, we'll respond uh, probably also in the chat, depending on the question. Okay, let's start, next slide. So what we'll talk about today, basically we'll present what is CTL, what is the Center for Technology Licensing and provide an overview of our activity. The second part will uh, we'll review what uh, university technology transfer and by doll, it will be presented by Lisa. Uh, and then we'll, uh, Biel will present the, the IP, intellectual property primer. So you know what is a patent, what's a different type uh, basically of intellectual property. And then Martin will finish with the, with you, with uh, the team, the BD team, evaluating for you uh, and commercializing the invention that you are providing to us. Next slide. So let's start with uh, Cornell Research and Innovation. Basically, it's a big machine. You can see the number here. It's 1.18 billion. It's a, what's a research expenditure in fiscal year 2022. It's a huge machine. So huge enterprise that is divided almost half half between Cornell University uh, in Ithaca and Geneva, as well as Cornell Tech, and also 49% of this research expenditure coming from White Cornell Medicine, as well as uh, White Cornell Medicine in Qatar. And you can see we are working with all the researchers across the five different campus in Ithaca, Geneva, New York, Cornell Tech in New York City, while Cornell in New York City, but also in Qatar. Next slide. Next. So the, the big part of uh, the research that is being the research expenditure, we receive a lot of funding from uh, federal government, uh, the federal agency. And uh, part of that, and Lisa will talk more about it, so I won't expand too much on that, uh, is drive our activity basically. Uh, and our activity that is to support the commercialization and manage the IP coming out of the lab at Cornell. And our mission is twofold. For that, first, we are trying to catalyze technology commercialization that is developed to develop product and services from uh, the university innovation and for societal benefit. And the second part is to promote new technology venture to foster economic development. So here, I, uh, we are sharing this uh, 
life, life cycle, basically, of technology commercialization. And uh, here we provide a fiscal year 2022 numbers. So you have an idea how it works. Bill will talk more about our commercialization process, but here you have as we lay to our activity number. First, you have the invention disclosure. We receive approximately 400 to 500 invention disclosure per year. So it's a lot of uh, activity for our, our BD team and our IP team uh, to review your invention. And after the work on assessing and protecting your innovation. And you can see here, just in the US in fiscal year 2022, we have received seven, uh, we received 79 uh, patent issue from USPTO. Uh, then the next uh, cycle is a marketing and licensing. And here, through the, uh, the number of fiscal year 2022, we uh, we have we executed 90 license and option. The next step it's a product that is being generated by either and services generated by either the established company or the new startup created. You can see we for fiscal year 2022 we had a form app form 12 startup and the revenue generated from the existing product and services was 36 uh, million. And again, this uh, this uh, revenue is uh, re-inject into the research uh, as well as distributed to the inventor and colleges. Next slide. So CTL, so what, what we do particularly, we have four pillars that guide our activity. So first one, I will start uh, the, by the second one, technology licensing and intellectual property. And because we are managing the university IP, we are supporting innovators like you, and we are helping marketing and licensing the technology. The second aspect is the technology, the second pillar of technology startup. So basically we are helping supporting the creation of new venture, technology ventures. We have a startup a fast track, basically express license. And we are supporting also the connection between with the investor as well as uh, any potential collaborator. Basically, we are supporting the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. The third aspect is education and outreach uh, through different programs that I will describe later on. And the last one, not the least, uh, it's a, mainly it's a new one. Uh, new one, it's been more since 2014, but it's growing. It's a gap funding and program supporting uh, the support of uh, the commercialization to the in-app gap funding. The goal is to accelerate the technology uh, commercialization and to support a new venture. And of course, to train uh, entrepreneur and new startup founder. Next slide. We'll share the slide with you, but basically you can see the main uh, major uh, activities uh, outcome. So the, the one that I would like to highlight is the gap funding that has been expanded during fiscal year 2022 because we receive more funding to support um, our innovator to ignite innovation acceleration, but also to create two new programs to support the venture creation, ignite fellow, but also ignite intern. And another out outcome I would like to highlight, it's 11 startup created, eight established in New York State. Uh, the new expanded express licenses um, that, that help uh, have a streamline in terms of negotiation of the licensing, agreements. And the last one is the fundraising uh, by the startup. It's a corner licensed startup. Basically, you can see the number. It's, uh, it's a startup that have a license with corners. They have raised $500 million uh, uh, to continue the growth and development of their technology and innovation. Next slide. And you can see here, uh, and it's why the focus, we are focusing a little more and more on startup supporting startup creation. And you can see that here to the exponential growth of the corner licensed startup. Uh, and you can see we have more than 230 startups created as of today. Not all of them are active, but we have more than 100 active as of today. And the cumulative fundraising of the startup as of the start uh, of this tracking is uh, 3 billion. Next slide. Another program, and, and uh, if you have any question about that, I'm happy to talk more about it. 
it's an in-night gap funding. Uh, basically, what you have to retain from this slide is that we are supporting more technology commercialization through different programs. The first one uh, that is relevant, particularly for you, is in-night innovation acceleration, because we are providing a small fund for you to continue the development, de-risking your technology. Uh, and it's available as a grant to faculty to PI with an invention disclosure from uh, the campus in Itaca, Geneva, and Gormer Tech. And I can discuss, if you have any question about the other one, we'll share this slide. But if you have any question about the other one, I'm happy to uh, discuss with you directly. Next slide. And another program to support, again, it's to support your innovation, the commercialization of your uh, innovation, and to help have a, a, an understanding of the market. It's a uh, SIVA. SIVA is Corner Innovation and Venture Advisor Group, and we are organizing roundtable where we're inviting up to three uh, inventor PI to uh, describe, they will usually they describe their technology and what they want to learn from the industry, from uh, the industry leaders. And we have from this group invited, specifically invited seasoned experts that provide their feedback. Uh, their insight on commercialization strategy, about the market, about the uh, development pathway. And the second aspect of this program is to facilitate connection because the main, the main, uh, the will even goal here, if, if you have a good connection to the industry, you are able to either uh, license your technology to the industry, but also to collaborate if you are creating a startup. Next slide. Another program uh, to support uh, us and to support you as well, the CTL practicum. Basically, it's an internship for graduate students. Uh, and they are spending nine months minimum to work on different technology uh, to also, they work up to 10 hours per week. We have a formal onboarding training. They support the marketing and the IP processes. The goal for us is to uh, work, uh, to have more more support for your technology to work on your technology. But the second goal, and I think the most important one, we are training, uh, educating a student about tech, the process of technology commercialization and the process of technology uh, venture creation. Next slide. We have also an innovation fellowship that has a goal as well to uh, train um, individual interested in career and business development, commercialization, technology venture creation. And we are helping them. Uh, we ha they have a full-time job at, at CTL for a year. And they, we are training them as well. The goal is to provide a career option, also career option for those uh, coming from academia. Next slide. Let's spend some time to talk uh, about quickly about uh, our team. Basically, the team, we have the leadership, uh, Alice Lee, uh, in, uh, the executive director at CTL, and Lisa Placanica, the senior managing director at CTL at Wild Corner. And um, we are basically here to execute uh, their vision for this, for, this, uh, for this group, for CTL. Next slide. And the group under Lisa and Alice, basically, we are working on supporting innovator and our different stakeholder. So first group, the technology initiative and outreach. Uh, it, we are working on managing those different programs, the gap funding, the internships, the CIVA group, and the educational programming. Next slide. The IP management team, uh, if you have disclosed uh, to us, you have worked with uh, some of them. And we have the patent manager, it's led by Bill. We have some patent management uh, group and also the IP service group, but it's good to have a face uh, to uh, to a name so you know directly with who you, you will be working with or you are working with. Next slide. And the last group, and uh, not the least, the BD and licensing team, because they are serving as a liaison uh, with uh, the innovator. And we have the BD and licensing team here based in Itaca, but they are serving Geneva, Itaca uh, campus, but also the campus at Cornell Tech. We share that slide, but you have more information about them. But you have the division between life science, physical science, but also Y Corner in New York City that Lisa will spend some time describing. 
Next slide. Now I turn uh, the floor to Lisa. Thank you, Linda. As I said, I'm Lisa Placanica, Senior Managing Director for CTL for the, the Wall Cornell Medicine Campus. CTL at, at Wall Cornell is part of a larger initiative called uh, Enterprise Innovation, which is really servicing faculty and trainees at the medical college and our sister institution, Cutter, from the earliest stages of programming and education, which is primarily run by our BioVenture eLabs, um, to gap funding mechanisms similar to the Ignite, but focused on research here at Wall Cornell Medicine from the Daedalus Fund for Innovation and forging partnerships like the, the partnership we have to be uh, TRI-I TDI, which is a therapeutics discovery engine and collaborative partner for Cornell, um, Rockefeller University and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So each of these groups works together collaboratively to support kind of key aspects of the innovation life cycle, really focused on medical uh, technologies. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of faces with, with names. Um, these are a lot of the key business development and licensing professionals that manage the portfolio. Each person is assigned to a particular department or technology area. Uh, for those of you who are at the Wall Cornell Medicine Campus, we're undertaking a department roadshow this year. So you're getting to meet a lot of us in person. Next slide, please. We also have our BioVenture eLab team headed by Lauren Busby and supported by Krista Fritz, who runs a lot of the programming around entrepreneurship and also identification of key resources to help nurture our new ventures. Next slide, please. In addition to all of the great programming offered by CTL and my colleagues up in Ithaca, we also have a, a stream of programming here that's really focused on um, matters that are germane to healthcare related innovations. Uh, some of, many of those are supported by the BioVenture eLabs. Some are supported particularly by the CTL team here at Wall Cornell Medicine, and many of them are, are joint. I'd like to point out specifically the fundamentals of academic business development, which is our equivalent of the CTL practicum. So for if you're a graduate student or you have graduate students in your laboratories at Wall Cornell Medicine and interested in having them be exposed to intellectual property commercialization, entrepreneurship activities, uh, that's a, a credit bearing course within the Department of Pharmacology. Next slide, please. Oh, here's some more information about it. Uh, so we tend to run this annually fall and spring. There are TA, paid TA positions available for successful course participants. And we really focus on intellectual property protection, technology evaluation, and then marketing and partnering of academic technologies. And this is an experiential hands-on learning course. So participants are working real technologies, real mentioned disclosures that are coming into CTL while Cornell Medicine and helping us build the business case around those. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we've talked a lot about what we do in tech transfer, um, and maybe we should have started with why. Uh, the why is that the Cornell University owns all intellectual property that's developed by their faculty, trainees, and staff that are either made in the course and scope of their employment obligations to the university or made through universe, use of funds, facilities, or resources. And the reason we do that is really to uh, for the public good, to help realize these nascent technologies into kind of a tangible, tangible output. Um, like all the universities that participate in this, we do for primarily, again, to kind of translate that research, but it also is a tool to help recruit and retain faculty and students, increase opportunities for additional sponsored research activities, and increase our increasing closer ties with industry and the commercial sector. And there's no financial risk to those who choose to work with, with CTL and intellectual property. All of those costs are borne by the university in, in staffing an office such as CTL. Next slide, please. And the reason why we take ownership of all of the intellectual property developed by the university is because we're a recipient of federal funds. And as Linda pointed out in the beginning, a lot of federal funding flows through the university. The Bayh-Dole Act was passed in 1980, and what that did was transfer ownership of intellectual property developed with federal funding from the government to the universities who were recipients of that funding. Um, pre bayh less than 5% of the over 30,000 patents uh, that were owned by the government that arose from federally funded research were actually licensed to commercial entities. So really 95% of the intellectual output of that research funding was not being developed and was just sort of hanging out there. 
uh, and they realized there was really lost, lost opportunity in realizing taxpayer money into products that would benefit the taxpayer and society at large. Um, at the time, only about a dozen institutions had commercial technology transfer offices. Now, every institution that receives furrow funds has some form of a technology transfer office. Um, they come in many sizes and shapes and philosophies and approaches, um, but everyone who has federal funding has to have one. And you can see in the graphic on the right that really from you know, 1996, which is you know, 16 years after the Biden whole act packs, really impressive numbers on economic development, on the invention output, on the number of companies formed, and really tangible products hitting the market that benefit patients. So, you know, since uh, 1980, over 200 drugs and vaccines were developed through public-private partnerships that were really driven by the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act, including the COVID vaccine. Next slide. Next slide. And Cornell's innovations have also had a tangible and measurable impact. These are just some of the products that arose from Cornell innovations that were transferred to the hands of commercial partners, be they existing companies or new ventures created based on the technologies that are on the market and benefiting patients and, and society writ large. Um, everything from ag tech innovation to you know, physical science innovation to healthcare innovation. Uh, so there's a real tangible output to uh, what the research that you're doing and the efforts that we do together with you to help pass this to a commercial partner. Next slide. Talked a lot about the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, in exchange for this right of owning the institutions, academic, owning the inventions, academic institutions do have certain obligations under uh, under this federal law. And this, this drives a lot of our um, decision-making process around how we manage intellectual property and commercial partnerships. So we have an obligation to, to diligently ensure these products or these innovations are developed and commercialized. We have a preference for license to US company. Uh, we have a preference for small business over large so we can continue to help support economic development and a requirement that uh, products are manufactured substantially in the United States. It also requires us to share back with the inventors and innovators of these technologies a portion of revenue that we get from any successful commercialization. So under the Cornell intellectual property policy, one third of it, all net revenue that the institution would receive from successful commercialization goes back to the, the inventor pool as personal income. Uh, we then in doing licenses, we have to grant, you know, reserve rights for the U.S. government. Uh, and we also have to have a preference for doing arm's length transactions, making sure that there's a competitive bidding process. Next slide. I'll pass this to my colleague, Bill Pegg, to get into the weeds on intellectual property, which is the heart of uh, all of the commercial transactions we do. Hey, thank you, Lisa. And we're not gonna get into the weeds. Uh, we'll just give a very uh, high level overview. And of course, invite you to reach out to us with any questions. So next slide, please. So this is a slide from our website, just showing the overall process in CTL. Starting on the left, obviously with what you do, research and ideation. Uh, next little uh, bullet over, no, sorry, to go back. Next little bullet over is disclosure. And that's a, a critical part. We need to know if you have something that could be uh, protectable and valuable. So it's best to reach out to us as early as possible. Once you think you have something, we will open discussions if we think that uh, additional uh, work would need to be done before filing. You know, We'll have those discussions but it's best to involve us as early as reasonably possible. In evaluation, we obviously take a look at what you submit and you know, uh, have those discussions with you, which starts a sort of a feedback loop where we simultaneously are looking at, looking at protecting the IP as well as marketing and licensing and making decisions about how to actually protect it. Uh, there are many options and many decisions to be made. And Martin will discuss the later aspects of it in terms of marketing, licensing, uh, startups, commercialization, et cetera. So next slide, please. So these are just a variety of examples of IP that are things that 
could impact society and could be commercializable. And we should, we should be brought into, uh, you know, into the discussion as early as possible on all of these types of technologies, but therapeutics, medical devices, diagnostics, et cetera. Some are protected by patents. Some would be copyright. And there are other, other ways that we can capture value in IP as well. So it's not just patents. The next slide, please. So this is just a graphic showing that there are you know, different types of IP, patents, trademark, copyright, and trade secrets. We don't really deal in trade secrets too much, but knowledge itself is something that could come into play in agreements commercializing the IP. Next slide. Okay, so a patent is a legal monopoly that's granted in return for public disclosure of an invention. So I won't go into too much detail, but basically the founding fathers of the country didn't really like monopolies, but they recognized that there was an important societal benefit to providing an incentive to people to actually disclose their technology so that they would benefit the larger public who after expiration of the patent would be able to practice that. And in the interim, since the patent is issued, people would be able to look at the technology and basically come up with improvements. So it's a monopoly, but it's a tolerated monopoly. So it doesn't give you the right to do something specifically. It actually gives you the right to exclude others from practicing the invention. So as an example, the patent could build on technology that other people have developed and could actually infringe somebody else's patent. So you might not be able to practice the invention without getting cross license to another patentee, but it would give you the right to exclude others who are doing exactly what is in your claims or similar to what is in your claims. Patents are valid for, from 20 years from the application date. So, you know, it's it used to be 17 years from the issue date. It was changed a number of years ago to better comport with other countries. So it's 20 years from the application date. And inventorship is something that's legally defined. So it's distinct from authorship and different from authorship. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Next slide, please. Uh, copyrights, just, just discussed very briefly. So a copyright protects an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Uh, Skywriting probably wouldn't qualify, but anything else in any other medium would qualify as copyright. So it protects literary works. It does not protect functional aspects of a computer program, such as the program's algorithms, formatting, logic, et cetera. And data itself is not copyrightable, but an arrangement or compilation of data can be protected. Next slide, please. I apologize for the noise in the background. So a trademark is any word, phrase, symbol, design, or combination that identifies the origin of a particular good or service. So origin means the manufacturer, who is producing it. Uh, so there are standard word trademarks such as Ruby Frost or Snapdragon, which are Cornell marks, and those are just words. So that word, if it's represented in any font, any color, it's still, if the word is there, that would be an infringement of the trademark for a defined protected uh, good or service. Uh, then there are special form trademarks, which are the logos that everybody is so familiar with. And it could be a shape, a color, a combination of uh, words with a logo, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So what can be patented? Uh, it's, I'll say historically, it was relatively easy to answer that question. More recently with the advent of computer software, AI, et cetera, 
it becomes more difficult. And case law interpretation has really created a lot of challenges in defining the exact boundaries of what is patentable or what isn't patentable. So under the statute, section 101, the subject matter to be protected is limited to one or more of four statutory categories. Uh, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacturing, or composition of matter, you know, that shall be entitled to a patent provided it you know, meets some other criteria. What can't be patented? Well, there are judicial exceptions that have come out through the case law, laws of nature, products of nature, abstract ideas, and natural phenomena. And up until about 15 years ago, that was a very that was very broadly interpreted. And basically the one of the Supreme Court quotes that was often used was uh, it covered anything under the sun made by man. So anything that wasn't uh, already in existence or in nature, you could patent. They didn't want you to be able to patent, say, an algorithm in the abstract, because that if you could prevent somebody from using an algorithm, you could basically stifle innovation and learning, etc. So it was fairly narrowly construed, but that changed about 15 years ago. Next slide, please. So two other conditions of patentability, novelty, which means nobody's done the exact same thing before. So that's a pretty easy criteria to avoid. And 103, which is non-obviousness. So a person of ordinary skill in the relevant art would not have reasonably been expected to have modified or combined known prior art to arrive at the claimed invention. So when an application is filed in the patent office, 99.99% of the time, it will be rejected. And the examiner, after having read the application, looked at the claims, well, now that they've read it, everything you know, it seems to be obvious because they just take reference A and reference B and put them together and they are able to arrive at the claimed invention. That starts the prosecution of the application where there's argument back and forth as to why the examiner is wrong. And you know, hopefully the applicant prevails. But it's obviousness is basically the assertion by the examiner or other fact finder that the level of departure from the known prior art is something that would have been fairly obvious. Next slide, please. Okay. Section 112 requires that the specification includes a written description of the invention, so a full written description, which goes back to the quid pro quo of when the application is published or the, in the issued patent is published, it gives the public the information that they need to understand what the invention is and how to make or use it, which is the next uh, element, the manner and process of making and using the invention so that the public benefits from that disclosure, which also ties into element C, the best mode contemplated by the inventor you the applicant can't hide the ball and disclose like a second best mode or third best mode and withhold the best mode because it's expected and you know it's an obligation on the applicant to fully disclose it in the best way possible so that the public can make and use it in exchange for that monopoly right and i'll just touch very briefly on the enablement part of it so under enablement, the level of description has to be enough so that a person of ordinary skill in the art does not have to engage in undue experimentation to make or use the invention. And under the case law, the courts will look at a variety of factors called the wand factors based on the case called uh, wands. So they look at the, the quantity of experimentation that's required, the amount or direction of guidance that's presented in the written description, the presence or absence of working examples, the nature of the invention, uh, the state of the prior art, 
relative uh, skill of those in the art and the predictability or unpredictability of the art, such as in the life sciences, it is generally less predictable because you're working with you know, living cells and, and organisms. So it's a little bit less predictable. So uh, an important takeaway for the written description uh, comes from a recent Supreme Court case, Amgen v. Sanofi, where Amgen had claims on uh, a very broad set of claims on antibodies involving uh, PCSK9 and a binding of particular areas to a sweet spot of that. And in the disclosure, they had uh, 26 or so examples of antibodies identified by the amino acid sequences. And they gave a roadmap of in the specification of how did we get these 26 antibodies that worked, they, they described the process. And the, Supreme, the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court concluded and held that even though there was a roadmap, it would have required an undue amount of experimentation for those skilled in the art to identify all of the rest of the antibodies that would have been covered under the broad claim. So it's just uh, an example of some of the nuances in some of these aspects, such as written description. Uh, next. So there are two types of patents that we discuss. One is provisional patent applications. Those are very informal. They can be filed relatively quickly. Uh, they could be filed the same day that we get them in an emergency, but it's not something we encourage because there are certain consequences to that, which I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, they're not examined. They're just placeholders. Uh, they're valid for one year and they provide priority for the subject matter that is disclosed and enabled. So, you know, the more that is disclosed, the better the chance that you can get that priority date. For, and then the second type of applications are non-provisional and patent cooperation treaty applications. Those are formal applications. They need to be filed within one year of the provisional application to get the priority back to that provisional application. And again, under 112, they must fully describe the invention in sufficient detail so as to enable a person of ordinary skill in art to make and use the invention. So those are fairly involved. We do need, and the more importantly, the outside counsel needs time to actually prepare those. So we, we try to start that process in earnest a month or more prior to the deadline but the more time that we have, the better. Next slide, please. So here's a general graphic of a patent life cycle, starting with the, obviously the ideation, conception, all the way on the left. Generally, we will perform a prior art search just to see you know, what's out there to get a feel for you know, how broad can the claims be. Then we would file a provisional patent application there's a period of 12 months where that is pending, and we can then file an application, the PCT application or U.S. non-provisional, claiming priority back to the provisional. Then down below it says IDS, we would need to file an information disclosure statement, meaning that there is a legal duty on applicant, meaning the inventors as well as CTL, to submit to the patent office any prior art that is known that could be material, meaning generally an examiner could consider that information relevant in making a determination of patentability. Uh, the application at that point is then in prosecution generally for two to five years. And at that point, that's sort of the, it, it takes generally about two years for the patent office to pick it up and review it, issue an office action. And that starts the back and forth between 
know, the applicant, Cornell, and the patent office, where they will assert obviousness and other grounds of rejection. We would, you know, raise contentions to those. And eventually, you know, within a number of years, we likely would get a patent granted, which starts a maintenance cycle where we have to pay maintenance fees to keep the patent alive at different time periods. So four years, eight years, 12 years. Uh, then after 20 years from the date of filing, it expires. So next slide, please. This is sort of a, a general graphic of the patent life cycle, which repeats some of the information on the prior slide, but you have research on the left, disclosure submitted to CTL, CTL assessment, and then the provisional filing is when the cost starts uh, occurring. Well, we have outside counsel prepare and file the patent applications. Then as we progress along that timeline, the PCT filing, national phase entry, prosecution, issuance, the costs continue to go up and up. So if we only file a provisional application and then only file a US non-provisional application, that could easily be $25,000 over you know, three to five years. If we start adding in filings in other jurisdictions, the cost can, can really become significant. So that's just a sort of a high level, you know, high level touch on the cost. Patents are fairly expensive to obtain. Next slide, please. So inventorship is a, is a really important takeaway. So as mentioned, it's different than authorship. It's a legal determination in view of case law and the facts presented. It's defined relative to the claimed subject matter of the invention. So in a provisional application, we try to put together a claim set to give some additional uh, insight as to who would be named as an inventor. Inventorship can change during prosecution if the claims are amended, canceled, or added. And to be a co-inventor, one must contribute to the conception of the claimed invention to be an inventor. Merely assisting implementation, being on a team or supervising a team does not automatically make a person an inventor. And co-inventorship requires more than a mere contribution of a well-known concept and or current state of the art. So I guess the bottom line is inventorship is determined on a claim by claim basis. So an inventor or somebody would proper, be properly named as a co-inventor if they make a non-trivial contribution that ends up in a single claim. You could have a hundred claims in the application and let's just say we have researcher one, researcher two, that do the work of claims one through 99, where those two researchers contributed to the conception of all of those, the subject matter of all of those claims. And researcher three contributed one idea, but it was a good one, non-trivial, and it was included in one of the claims, then that researcher three would be properly named as a co-inventor. But there could be other people who were on the team, but did not contribute to the conception of something that was claimed, and they would not be properly named as an inventor. So that the bottom line is, it's defined by law. It's something that we would need to work with you and outside counsel to assess on an ongoing basis as the claims change. And up front, it's good if we at least discuss it and try to get a feel for it to get a baseline uh, early on. Next slide, please. So here are some Cornell IP policies, which I presume you're all familiar with, but policy 1.5 deals with inventions and related property rights. Policy 4.10, use of Cornell's trademarks, logos, and policy 4.15 on copyright. So I advise you to please familiarize yourself with those if you have any questions. 
Next slide. Okay, public disclosure. This is a very important thing to keep in mind always. A public disclosure can jeopardize patent rights. In the US, there is a one year grace period from a public disclosure in which we can file a patent application. So we don't lose all rights, but the rest of the world uses something called absolute novelty, where a publication prevents you from filing a patent application at all. So if you throw up something on archive or bio archive, that's immediately a public disclosure, you would then not be able to file abroad, which would limit the commercial applicability, sort of the potential for the IP to the US only. Based on the technology, maybe that makes a difference, maybe not, but it's just important to keep in mind that if there is a discussion at a conference, you know, sort of a public discussion at a conference, uh, posters, open thesis defense, uh, anything that's published, anything that's available to the public that's not controlled by a non-disclosure statement or non-disclosure agreement would be considered public and rights could be lost. So it's very important to reach out to CTL prior to any public disclosure so we can have the discussion about protection prior to losing any rights. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'll pass it off to Martin to discuss commercialization. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, clearly we didn't rehearse this because um, we're pushing up against the hour. I hope people are okay if we stay a little longer, uh, but I will do my best to fly through the remaining slides as quickly as possible. So we can leave some room for questions at the end. Um, so yeah, um, as um, you can tell by Bill's summary, we, we certainly in our office, we spend a lot of time on, on patents and figuring out patentability. And, and, then, and then of course, um, as Bill mentioned, uh, the patenting process uh, is a fairly lengthy one and also can become rather expensive. And that those are all reasons why we, we do spend so much time uh, managing, uh, determining patentability and then managing a patent portfolio. Uh, but uh, another reason why patents are really important to us, of course, is, is because they tend to give the strongest form of IP protection, although they're not always the most appropriate form of IP protection. Um, Example would be if you work on software, um, maybe a patent is not really the, the most appropriate um, way to, to go and to rely on the patent uh, for various reasons. Um, and so, yes, and, and also as Bill mentioned, uh, patents and other IP rights, they give you that give the owner of the IP right the, the right to exclude others, but certainly that's not what Cornell wants to do, right? So why why are we even so worried about IP and patent protection? It's because we're hoping and we're striving towards uh, using the IP and leveraging IP and patents um, um, for the benefit of a commercial partner. So so we we're trying to create. Um, opportunities where a potential commercial partner uh, really finds value in that IP protection. And so they can exclude potential competitors uh, and therefore um, have the motivation and, and uh, justification to further invest into the co commercialization and development of, of these technologies. Um, so, so this is really the other aspect of um, how we um, have to evaluate and assess um, invention disclosures. We really try to uh, get an understanding of uh, what could be the commercial potential uh, with, with a particular invention or, or innovation. Um, and so, so questions about the market size and, and, um, and uh, potential hurdles along the way, uh, will come up. I'm not going to read through all these uh, th these questions. These are just some of the most important examples. Uh, but 
uh, essentially what it comes down to is we try to determine, uh, and, and usually that is through a feedback loop, right? We talk with the inventors, we try to reach out to, to companies and potential partners, maybe entrepreneurs and investors um, to better understand what the, what the value proposition might be and how our technology and, and IP protection uh, can really be leveraged to to create an, an, um, a commercial opportunity. Um, yes, I think that's really all I wanted to say here. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how do we do with this? We, we reach out to various potential partners. Um, it's a lot of networking. Uh, we use various platforms. Uh, obviously the web is important and, and social media. Um, we, we do use email campaigns. Uh, we, we also have ongoing conversations with strategic partners where whom we have a more sort of an ongoing relationship with and where we are continuing to build those relationships. Um, but it really all starts with, we need some sort of marketing material. We tend to call them tech briefs, uh, one page teasers, if you will. Um, uh, Linda mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have a, a CTL practicum program. So uh, we work with PhD trainees, we PhD students and, and try to leverage their respective expertise in, 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 the, in their fields um, to help us uh, assess um, market potential and identify companies that we can reach out to and, and, um, and, and collect feedback that we can then use to reevaluate and, and reassess and, and maybe tweak our strategy as we go forward. Um, we do events. Um, Linda also mentioned uh, the SIVA um, group that we've created now, what, about a year ago, maybe a little more, um, a more formalized um, group that we bring together uh, every quarter to for them to learn about uh, various technologies and give us uh, honest honest feedback and 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 it has been very very helpful in many many cases so far. Um, alumni and friends of Cornell, of course, are always important for us to include even uh, in in various contexts and various uh, platforms and, and uh, groups that we have connections with. Uh, and of course, we also leverage the wider Cornell and I Ithaca and, and, and New York City uh, ecosystems. Um, entrepreneurship at Cornell, uh, Riff, Ithaca here, um, uh, incubator, uh, various inc incubators we work with uh, are some examples. Um, yeah, so again, important really to to emphasize it, it involves a lot of networking and and uh, we don't know all the answers. Uh, oftentimes we find our inventors uh, may not all not know all the answers. Uh, um, and so it's important for us to reach out to experts and, and um, folks in industry who, who may have that expertise. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, and again, important really for, for me to emphasize uh, the inventors play a very critical role in this whole process. Um, we really see uh, CTL and the inventors in a, in a partnership um, to ultimately uh, achieve commercial uh, success and marketing success. Um, there's um, some anecdotal evidence perhaps in the tech transfer uh, community that about 80%, maybe sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, but a, a, a very large chunk of university uh, licensing transactions ultimately are done with startups that where the inventors uh, may have an active role in or uh, are the co-founders of these startups or other licensing transactions might be done with uh, companies where the initial relationship really was brought to us um, by the researchers, by their uh, existing relationships and networks. Um, that's not to say that we always strive for, for um, 
higher hit rate, if you will, with our own marketing efforts. Uh, and we certainly have been quite successful in the more recent past uh, using forest strategies. Uh, but again, uh, for the inventors to take home with them, uh, it's important for them to, to think about their role, uh, that if they go, if you go to a conference, uh, you, you're, you're not just a scientist talking to a peer scientist, uh, explaining your science and maybe exploring the next project uh, that, that could be of interest in the lab. Um, but um, we're also hoping that you can help us uh, making connections to to industry um, in in selling your invention and, and, and uh, creating those commercial opportunities with us. That's all we had, I think. Yeah, here's our contact information again. And uh, but so, do we have questions? I see there's some messages popping up here. There's a question that has not been answered yet. I believe is coming from uh, Francesco. On slide 41, you mentioned awarded federal grant application as an example of public disclosure. Can you please clarify uh, why and what extent this is considered a public disclosure? Grant proposal are confidential. Oh, you mentioned, you answered that bit, right? Uh, yes, I answered that. Okay. So next question, Jay Roy. Will CTR help with commercialization for an already obtained patent? Sorry, was, what was this for an or, already obtained patent? Yes. Uh, presumably obtained through our office. Um, no, it says uh, patent not obtained via Cornell. Ah, okay. Not obtained via Cornell. Yeah, so CTL's role is, so we are the stewards of Cornell inventions, Cornell intellectual property. So, so part of our evaluation process, we didn't really get into this much here, but is certainly we do need to determine whether the invention or whatever the intellectual property is, is owned by Cornell to begin with, right? And that's what the um, intellectual property policies give us some guidance for. And so, so we make that determination um, usually it's pretty straightforward and it's not really a question, but occasionally it does become a question. And, but, but for our office, we, we are really only able to, uh, work with Cornell owned IP. And I see a question about Ignite, um, and Chris, can you go quickly on the slide about Ignite? So basically there are four programs under, uh, the Ignite umbrella. And we for Ignite Innovation Acceleration, it's a grant to researcher to the lab. And we are awarded, we have two cycles. We are awarding approximately five uh five project proposal per cycle. It's mean 10 between 10 to 12 per year. Uh Ignite uh, fellow for new venture, basically we are recruiting um individual to be the next uh, CEO or CTO. So it means next co-founder uh, alongside with a co-PI. A co it will be a co-applicant as well, a PI that will be a co-applicant. And we are awarding approximately per year uh, between five to seven um, and recruiting five to seven fellow. For corner licensed startup, uh, it's a, this time it's up to 50K that we are providing to a safe note. Uh, it's a vehicle vehicle that uh, that provide uh, um, future equity, at least a promise for future equity, we are awarding approximately 10 per year, up to 10 per year. And the last one, Cornell Licensed Startup, basically it's a program to help a student, Cornell student to have an exposure into startup. And uh, the applicant are the Cornell Licensed Startup and uh, that have a license with us. And we are providing up to 10, uh, we are supporting, I, was, I should say, supporting and paying the internship of up to 10 interns. So it means up to 10 startup. And is it common for individuals or startups to utilize multiple columns here? So for example, get the 50K and then later go on to the, the 120K or the, the other 
Uh, yes, it's it's possible. If you are in a lab, you are you can if you have an eventual disclosure with us, you can leverage in IT innovation acceleration. Then when you are when you have your startup incorporated, you are eligible to use a in IT startup and even in IT intern for startup as well. I I, I do want to clarify the it, there is a little bit of a. Uh, time here uh so this they are mm -hmm. they are in sequence in a way right so the yes correct innovation acceleration is and also the fellowship for uh, new ventures they're both before a company even exists right there's no startup yet that they're still within cornell uh, activities within cornell yes it's to the lab uh the support is to the lab for innovation acceleration in night fellow and the support is to the form incorporated startup for under in a startup project right. and under in night intern for startup. The fellow, since it's a safe note, mm -hmm. doesn't that mean there has to be a company? Yes, yeah. it's a it's a future, it's a promise for a future safe, uh, it's a safe note that will be when the company is incorporated, uh the principal that we uh that includes a salary, uh the salary benefit as well as any research uh, ex uh, expenditure that we provided to the lab will be taken through a safe note to the company. That the will be is sort of the the transition that it, that it really tries to. Uh, yeah, it's a transition, but at some point the goal is for uh, to have a starter at the okay. end of the program. Okay, I mean I understand what a safe note is, but somebody just said that the fellows you wouldn't necessarily have to have a company but you kind of do have to have a company to give out a safe note. in the in the uh, upon graduation the fellows upon would, have, graduation. would have a, a company. i see i see by the end of the of the period yeah. got it okay thanks is there another question any last question for for us Maybe, Chris, you want to touch upon the next upcoming event in the survey? Sure. Um, so uh, this slide here highlights some upcoming events. We have this event highlight is Wild Corner Medicine's Enterprise Innovation Dean Symposium. You can read all about it here. Um, and then you can follow up for registration events here at this um, code, which is also clickable for when I send this out. Um, we have virtual and in-person office hours that we offer through CTL and WCM staff. So if you have specific questions that you want to meet with a member of our office on, you can click or scan this code and that brings you to our events page, which has all of our in, uh, office hours listed and also any of our upcoming events listed. So you can check all of that out. We also didn't talk about on this last slide, following all of our socials here, which is clickable and scannable. Um, we'll give you the most up-to-date information about what we're doing. And then lastly, we have this 45 second survey that we ask you to consider filling out. It gives us an idea of what you want to see for these IP, these IP series, because ultimately we are here to serve you and give you the most information that you need to be successful. So please take a minute and scan or click that and fill out our survey. And we hope to see you for a next event. Thank you, everybody. I don't see any additional question. So uh, we'll follow up, uh, provide uh, Chris with follow up, uh, and she will share this slide. And she will provide in the coming weeks the next IP series. It will be every other month, uh, most likely. And she will provide the next IP series. And wow. as she mentioned, it's uh, an opportunity to provide edu uh, an education about IP overall and how to make the most of uh, the resource at Cornell to support your commercialization. Hi, thank you all. Thank you. Everybody. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks for thanks for waiting longer <laughs> and staying longer. Bye.